قَالَهْ بِطَا مِنْهَا جَمِيعًا بَعْضُكُمْ لِبَعْضٍ عَدُوٍّ فَإِمَّا يَأْتِيَنَّكُمْ مِنِّي هُدًى فَمَنِ اتَّبَعَ هُدَايَ فَلَا يَضِلُّ وَلَا يَشْقَى ونعوذ بالله من شرور انفسنا ومن سيئات اعمالنا من يهدي الله فلا مضل له ومن يضلل فلا هادي له واشهد ان لا اله الا الله وحده لا شريك له واشهد ان محمدا عبده ورسوله صلى الله عليه واله وسلم My brothers and sisters in Islam, and also my brothers and sisters from Adam, alayhi salam. I always like to start my speaking engagements by thanking the people who invited me. Because when we don't thank the people, we don't thank Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So thank you, all brothers and sisters who helped organize this talk. And by Allah's permission, made it possible for me to be here today. I also would like to start with a statement from the best of creation after the Prophet وسلم, Abu Bakr al-Sadiq, radiallahu an, who said, I am no better than any of you. And if I was to do that which is good, then aid me. And if I was to do that which is incorrect, then rectify me. This humbleness is something that many Muslims Brothers and sisters, we struggle to implement. But this characteristic and mannerism is what guided me to Islam by Allah's permission. Many of you know my story, my journey to Islam. Many of you may not. So what I'll do is briefly just go through an explanation of how Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala guided me to this beautiful religion of Islam. I was born and raised in the streets of Harlem, New York City. A large percentage of my life, I was exposed to drugs and violence and crime. And this was by default. This was not by my own hands. Growing up in an environment that breeds violence, drugs, and crime, this was my first teacher. These were the things I was exposed to. This is not something I went searching for. It's not something I went looking for. It was by default. And growing up in this environment, if it wasn't for the moral structure that was established in my household, I would have completely been consumed by this impression that was made by, uh, by my community. And I would not have had no sense of what is right. So I say that to say that the moral structure that starts with many of us starts at home. Alhamdulillah, I was taught good manners. I was taught to respect my elders. I was taught to respect those who respect me. And first and foremost, respect myself. But being in this environment, I always needed something that would help me vent or help me express some of the sadnesses that came with living in this harsh reality. And that's when I discovered that I had the ability to write. You know, I went to school just like everybody else. Wasn't the best student, but I knew how to count money. <laughs> you know, I was a mathematician. Alhamdulillah. But when I discovered that I had this ability to write, I used this as a means of, uh, uh, like as a therapeutic means of, you know, 
coming to grips with my reality. So instead of keeping all these things bottled in, I used to write these things down in the form of a diary every day to help me suppress the frustration that came with living in this harsh reality surrounded by drugs, crime, and violence. And by law's permission, this talent propelled me into success in the music business, where I was able to write over 52 top 10 hits. I sold over 7 million records worldwide. I traveled the world. I seen a lot of things. And I learned a lot from these experiences. And one thing that I learned was that everything has an expiration date. Everything has an expiration date. Some of us are inspired by some of the things we see on TV, mainly in the entertainment business, this glorification of this lifestyle many people think to be quote unquote success. And the sister says something beautiful how success is measured by material things. Depending on how much materialistic things you accumulate determines your level of success. And in the lifestyle I was living, in the business I was in, this was very true. But brothers and sisters in Islam, you know Islam does not teach us this. That true wealth and success comes from seeking nearness to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and following the sunnah of the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi wa sallam. So through this success that I obtained in the music business, like I said, I was exposed to a more magnified aspect of the reality that I was living prior to the music business. Meaning the streets was the epitome of drugs, crime, and violence, but the music business was a reflection of the same drugs, crime, and violence. So as another sense, I jumped out of the pot and into the fire. But many of you, you only see these three minute and 42 second clips of this glorified lifestyle. Y'all think that every rapper just bathes in champagne, drives cars, the price of your house, wear jewelry to the point he doesn't need a light at night. <laughs> a lot of y'all take these as symbols of success. But like I said, everything has an expiration date. If I took a bite out of an apple and sat it right here, went to the bathroom and came back, the apple would turn brown, that fast. It won't be crunchy white anymore. So everything expires. Even the things you think have the most value, they quickly disappear. So like I said, Having the success, I was exposed to a lot of things but it was only a, a mere reflection of everything I was already exposed to. So I remember at one point in my career, I did a song with this Lebanese artist by the name of Masadi. And by doing this song with Masadi, which I never really thought any success would come out of it, you know, because at the time I was jahil, I was ignorant, saying, what's going to come out of doing a song with this Arab kid? Like, I didn't even know Arabs knew anything about music, I didn't know. Because <laughs> Wallahi, being in New York City, I had a very one-dimensional perception of Islam. In most cases, to be honest, I had no perception of Islam because I came in a community, I grew up in a community that was multicultural, you know, very diverse, many different ethnicities, many different cultures. But being in the inner city, we all shared something in common and I was learning how to struggle and survive in the inner city. So whether you were an Asian person who had a laundromat or a Chinese restaurant, you was no different than me. Senegalese brothers that had all the taxi services. SubhanAllah, the Pakistanis had all the pharmacies. You know, And the Yemenese brothers, they owned most of the local grocery stores. So this was my perception of the Muslim. Not Islam, just Muslims. So I was always aware of the Muslim, but I never understood the religion. Because it was something, for some strange reason, that wasn't really exposed. Meaning maybe these brothers prayed at home. Maybe these brothers, you know, concealed their faith. Allahu Akbar. But when I did this song with Masadi, it propelled me into a region of the world 
who was, well, that was also inspired by this lifestyle and his music and all these things that I never thought you know, Muslims paid attention to. Because being, a music, um, being in the music business, we only have this short range perception of mostly secular places that appreciate what we do. So we think of like France, you know, Europe, things of that nature. We don't think that Saudi Arabia, you know, the Emirates, we don't think these people will even think about music. But that quickly came to, you know, it came to a very abrupt halt. And by doing these songs, I was invited to many Muslim countries. And before I get into how my journey took off, I want everybody to know that me prior to accepting Islam, I never received any dawah. No one sat down and talked to me about Islam. No one passed me a pamphlet. No one sat down and read me a book. I wasn't fortunate to have a Muslim friend bring me to a, a, a speaking engagement such as this one. I'm pretty sure some non-Muslim brothers here, you know, by way of his Muslim friend dragging him out the house today. Alhamdulillah. But I wasn't fortunate to have this brought to me. This was solely from Allah's guidance. I was at the pinnacle of my career. There was nothing wrong with my career. There was nothing wrong with the bounties that I was receiving from my success. There was nothing wrong. Nothing was broke. Nothing was broke. Everything was moving at the pace that I had strived for. So nothing was off. But then when I started to visit these Muslim countries, gradually I started to learn about Islam. I remember first going to West Africa. I went to Senegal. I went and visited Gori Island, which was one of the first slave houses. Now, mind you, many African Americans in America, we all, in some way, shape, or form, are seeking an understanding of our lineage. Because our lineage is lost. Our lineage was lost through slavery. So we don't know our usul. We don't know where we come from. We go as far as back as our great grandfather, and that's it. And, he, and his birthplace is America. So it's hard to say where we're from. So it is this burning desire to understand where we come from. And this was the first step to Allah's guidance. He took me to West Africa. I was able to visit Gori Island. And I remember the tour, the, the tour, the tour that they had was kind of like a structured tour. But then I seen this, this, this African brother just leaning on the side. I said, he must know something that everybody else don't know. So I approached him. And he gave me my own private tour. And he explained to me how 60 million slaves passed through this island. He said, six million never left the soil. I said, wow, why is that? He said, because they were Muslims. And they refused to submit to anything other than their creator. So they died fighting right on the soil. I said, subhanAllah, that's crazy. I never thought that. Because me being ignorant, I was thinking, you know, they, they had like gangsters back then. Like, you must be gangsters. They, they didn't want to, you know, they wasn't going for it. They had their little sticks and stuff, like, we ain't going nowhere. So I'm thinking they gangsters. But when he told me that they were Muslims, and it takes a certain individual to indoctrinate this understanding of worshiping the one that created you and dying upon that. So this encouraged me. I was like, subhanAllah. So now I know a little bit about myself. I probably still ain't going to find my great, great, great grandfather or nothing, you know. I could try Ancestry.com and all this stuff. But at the end of the day, that was enough information for me. And it showed me the integrity of these men didn't come from their own will. It came from them being servants of the Most High. So alhamdulillah. Then I remember going to Kazakhstan. This is Middle Eastern Asia. SubhanAllah, I had an um, opportunity to hang out with the president there for like nine days. He was a very young guy. He had a lot of youthfulness with him. And I remember asking him, I said, yeah, how you say what's up? Like, how y'all say what's up to each other? Like, how you say what's up? Like, what's popping? Like, what up? <laughs> And he looked at me and said, Assalamu alaikum. I'm like, come on, man. <laughs> yeah. I mean, this guy, he looks like Yao Ming or something. I'm like, you don't say Assalamu alaikum. No way. I live in New York. I've been to Chinatown. They don't say Assalamu alaikum. <laughs> you know? And I'm just taking you through this journey in my ignorant state. I'm not here to be sarcastic or anything. I'm just really taking you through this ignorant state of thinking. So I'm saying to myself, how does this Asian guy stand in front of me 
and tell me that salamu alaikum is the way he says hi. So that right there was the first lesson in the diversity of Islam outside of what I was seeing in New York. Then I remember being invited to the UAE. Alhamdulillah. I went to Muscat, Oman, I went to Abu Dhabi, I went to Dubai. And I remember, you know, going to Dubai. And I remember it being no different from like what I was already exposed to. Because well, all y'all mean, every country I used to go to, they always had this guy who I like to call the welcome wagon. He always had the haram waiting for me. Oh, no, be happy to see you. Yo, I got this, I got the cars, the girls, and everything. Loan, how you doing? Nice to meet you. We got the cars, the girls, and everything. Loan, we got everything for you. So it was this welcome wagon guy was everywhere. Every country I went to, he was just, you know, this, this haram was waiting for me there. <laughs> so when I went to Dubai, I remember doing a show, got off the plane, went to this hotel, Grand Hyatt, I remember, dropped my bags off. Went to this club, and I'm looking at like Arabs in a club, like, like wow. <laughs> and this was only from my tainted perception of what I thought was, you know, cool and not cool. Because remember, I'm saying to myself, I know these people that have like this, 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 this immense faith in something, but what are they doing here? But then after that, brothers took me to Abu Dhabi. And I remember leaving the club in Dubai very late, like maybe three, four in the morning. So by the time I got to the uh, uh, Emirates Palace, this is like the only seven star hotel in the world. This is pretty cool on loan salary, not Amir. <laughs> but when I got there, I remember the sun rising, and I remember being on the balcony watching the sun rise. And it almost brought tears in my eyes because for a very long time I had neglected the beauty of creation. You understand? I was in a business where day was day and night was night, and it didn't really have no significance. What I do in the day, I do in the day. What I do at night, I do at night. That's it. Cool. I never looked up to see if it was half a moon or one-fourth of a moon or full moon. I didn't pay attention to these things. But seeing the sun rise and overlooking the Arabian Sea, birds flying, I was like, subhanAllah. Something just changed my heart. And you know how it is when you have something eating at you and you don't want to let it go. You don't want to let it pass. So to suffice this, this feeling that I had, I just ran down to the lobby of the hotel and the first Muslim I seen, I ran up on him and I asked him, how do I become a Muslim? And this man looked at me like I was crazy. Because <laughs> normally as Muslims, we like to initiate conversations where we can give dawah or try to, you know, open up the forum to speak about this beautiful religion. But this is the flip side. I'm running up on this guy trying to extort him for an understanding. Like, how do I want to become a Muslim? He said, what do you, you want to be a Muslim? I said, I want to be a Muslim. Now listen, I said, I want to be a Muslim. You, you, you want to be a... I'm like... <laughs> and I can tell by the rambling of his words, he's really like off guard. You know, this is not... He didn't get to start off with tea. He didn't get to do his little presentation. So he's kind of like off. Like, But he said, no, it's simple. He said, Ashadu an la ilaha illallah Muhammad Rasulullah. So I mentioned what he said, and I said it, and I stood there, and I was just like, that's it? <laughs> He's like, no, 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 it's called Kalash, you're a Muslim. I said, I'm a Muslim? <laughs> so once he gave me the confirmation that that was it, that resolve that I felt in my heart was real. It was real and it was genuine. And all it was was a simple testimony. Because I'm looking at the guy, well, oh, yeah, I'm telling him, like, that's it. Like, we don't got to dip me in the ocean. Like, I don't go get, you know, one of the outfits you got. Like, how do we do it from here? He's like, no, no, Kalash, she was a Muslim. So, subhanAllah, I'm like, wow. And this same simplicity that came with taking the shahada. It's the same simplicity 
that we struggle to practice every day in Islam. So I say this to say, in a nutshell, because I do want to leave some time for questions and things of that nature, is brothers and sisters in Islam, you have to be very, very mindful of how you conduct yourselves. You have to be very, very mindful. Because while many of you who may have had your, you know, your state of ignorance, your, your jahiliya, and maybe some of y'all have been paying attention to my videos and other artists as well. While you were wasting your time watching us, look, look what happened. I was watching you. <laughs> While you were so concerned with maybe how I thought about you, or how you thought about me, rather, turned out, look how I felt about you. Because the first time in my life I seen Islam being practiced out openly. And that's what inspired me, seeing brothers in all white, Gutras, smiling, greeting each other, hugging each other. And I said, wow, you can't even hug somebody like that in New York unless you've known them for 20 years. <laughs> you can't even get that close. You try to hug a dude, he might think something wrong with you, you know. <laughs> you got issues, like, yo, why is you so close? Yo, why, why is you so close? <laughs> So to know that this brotherly love, this brotherhood, sisterhood as well, is something that is implemented in a day-to-day -day basis. This is a practice. This is not something that, you know, is forged. This is a practice that goes in accordance with our faith. So I say this to say, be very mindful how you conduct yourself because you have no idea who is paying attention to you. And they're not paying attention to the, 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 you know, because I know a lot of you brothers and sisters that I can look around briefly and pan. Yeah, y'all have a lot of stylish quality with, you know, guarding your modesty and things of that nature. Brothers as well. But these are not the things that people are paying attention to. It's not the beautiful Kimar you might have on right now. Brothers is not, you know what I'm saying, this old custom made Saudi cut though we might have on right now. Laser cut, you know, and, you know this is not what it is. It's the characteristics and the mannerisms that come from the Muslim. Because I remember the brothers taking me to a brother house. And I've told this story many times because this was one of the things that inspired me. Was the humbleness and the hospitality that I received from the Muslim. And a Muslim who didn't have much. As soon as I came to his house, he was like, fuck them. I looked at the brother like, what the fuck do me? <laughs> he said, no, 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 sit, sit, sit. I said, where? He said, there. Yeah. So I'm looking, that's the best chair in the house. Like, he wants me to sit in the best chair? And believe me, I had a little entertainment um, um, you know, area in my home, and I took my chair very serious. I was like, screaming at my son, what you doing in my chair? Get out of my chair, man. Like, it was my chair. This man let me sit in his best chair. Fuck the. Yeah, have tea, have dates, have this, have that. He's just giving me all this stuff, and I'm sitting here with books in my hand, I got dates, tea, I'm juggling all this stuff. <laughs> And, it, and coming from where I'm coming from, I'm thinking there's an angle. There's got to be something. I don't know if this man wants tickets to the concert. I don't know what he's working at. But it just seems like he's being a little too nice. And as I'm accumulating these gifts, I'm starting to look around his house, and his house is just disappearing because he's giving me all this stuff. <laughs> now, mind you, I'm around multi-million dollar people who wouldn't even give you advice, and that's free. They won't even give you advice on how to be better in the business. Like, you know, I'm going to tell you a little secret how you can sell some more records. On. You can't even get advice. And these people are multi-millionaires. You go to your house, if you have, you go to their house, if you have any manners, you'll just be standing there. They'll never say, have a seat. You'll just be standing there like, all right, I got manners. I'm waiting for you to say, have a seat. <laughs> you know, so by seeing that, it showed me so many different aspects of this character that many of us are struggling and striving to implement. And it doesn't matter who's striving the hardest or who's striving the less. But we do know that the best of the people in the eyes of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, this characteristic, this humility, this passion for loving the creator, this is something that we all try very hard to be upon. And may Allah make us from these people. So like I said, be very, very mindful of how you conduct yourself. 
Because a lot of the things that I had that I thought had value, they quickly became nothing. Platinum, diamonds became metal and rock. Ferrari just became car. These things started to deplete as far as value. Sometimes I used to be offended because people would speak to my, my watch first. Like, y'all heard you cop the new? Like, you didn't even say hi. <laughs> first thing you reaching for is my arm. I heard, yo, I heard, where's that? Like, why you wanna, like, come on. I'm standing here. Sometimes I used to even test the water. Let me just go out with a white t-shirt on and just see how many people speak to me. Oh, how many people just going, you know? And you'll quickly realize how many people respect you for who you are versus what they feel you have to offer. And that's why it was easy for me to trade all my friends for 1.5 billion brothers and sisters. It was easy. That was the fairest trade. It was the easiest choice I made. Once brothers found out I stopped drinking and smoking and partying, like 3,000 people stopped calling me. I told people I stopped drinking, another 3,000 stopped calling. Pretty soon, like I was at peace. My phone wasn't ringing like it used to ring, and it was just like, okay. Now I knew what my true value was with these people. I knew now that my friendship was, and I'm not saying all of them, don't get me wrong. Some of these brothers are good people, and me and Lord guide them. But the reality of it is the majority of them was only there, and they had this statement in the music business, you're only as good as your last record. SubhanAllah, that's your life expectancy rate. You're only as good as your last record. So that means if you put out a wax song, tomorrow you might lose everything. So you can imagine the desperation that comes with some of these people trying to maintain visibility while you sitting up here fascinated by what they're doing. They're dying inside. They're dying inside. I've learned that most of these people who have quote unquote success are some of the most miserable people in the world. Miserable. And they only find joy in living vicariously through you. So we become vampires. It takes you to come and see how, like, and be fascinated with my Mercedes for me to like the Mercedes. I don't even care. We're just sitting there. But you come in there, wow, you have a Mercedes. Oh, yeah, yeah. You ain't never seen a Mercedes before? <laughs> I'm going to have my man clean it up and everything. I'm going to dust off the seats. We'll go take a ride. But before, it would have just sat there. I didn't care. But I have to live vicariously through you. You come, you see a boat. Boat sitting there, seaweed, dust, dirt all on the boat. It ain't even move. But you say, oh, wow, you got a boat. Oh, you never been in a boat? <laughs> so it becomes this fascination with your fascination. So in actuality, we become vampires. Sucking the joy from you so we can feel like we're doing something. I want to be left. And when I see so many of you young brothers and sisters that's inspired by this stuff, it really just, it, it hurts me because, first of all, if I wanted to, I could implement this permissible form of selfishness, which is save myself and save my family. I don't really have to put myself in a position where I'm standing before the people sharing this type of, you know, talk with you guys. But a part of me feels like I contribute to some of this, even though Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has forgiven me for these things. I should be somewhere saving myself. But a part of me still feels responsible because I contribute to some of these things. And the result of that was some of the things that changed me and put me on the course of searching for better. Because a lot of y'all don't know the story behind the story. Y'all don't know about the young girl that comes to the club with the fake ID and some guy slip a date rape drug, drug in her drink and now she gets dragged off and gets harmed, raped or something. You don't hear that story. That story don't reach your ears. You don't hear about the guy that gets shot in the club. You don't hear about the guy that gets stabbed in the club. You don't hear about the guy who's been swindled and tricked out of all of his wealth because he didn't sign a contract or he had anybody to educate him on the business aspect. This is some of the things that happen repetitively in this business. But the business is only designed to show you what you want to see. And therefore, you're being misguided. But for the Muslim brothers and sisters that are upon clear guidance, which inshallah ta'ala, bifnilah.
We're all upon clear guidance, clear understanding of who our Lord is and who is the messenger that was sent and what is our religion. These things you must safeguard. Hold on tight to it. And do not allow what's propagated or what's in opposition of this understanding get the best of you. Because we used to have this saying in Jahalia, curiosity killed the cat. Don't let your curiosity kill you. Because my appreciation for Islam comes from coming from a harsh reality. But it's kind of like this perpetual door. Many of you are born and raised Muslim. By show of hands, how many are born and raised Muslim? <laughs> Alhamdulillah. How many of y'all, such as myself, has reverted to this beautiful religion of Islam? Alhamdulillah. And how many of my brothers and sisters from Adam, alayhi salam, meaning my non-Muslim brothers and sisters, how many of y'all are present? I know you did, it's okay. <laughs> we won't hurt you. Alhamdulillah. But the beauty is you've been born upon this truth. You've been born upon this understanding of what is correct. But the sad part about it is, once you start to develop a curiosity of the opposite, you put yourself in more danger than I've ever been, being born and raised in this environment. Because being born in any environment, just like animals, if an animal is born in the snow like a polar bear, physically it adapts to the weather, it feeds, it hunts, all based on its environment. So I was bred in an environment where it became natural for me to learn how to survive. You being curious and looking around, y'all all look like I have very good parents, come from very good homes, very good upbringing, trying your very best to destroy yourself putting more energy in trying to destroy yourself than using this energy to increase yourself in that which you already know, with that which you already know to be true. So my appreciation came from spending most of my life chasing what was wrong and finding what was true, and it made it easy for me to abstain from these things and embrace what you already had. You had this already. I remember when I was a kid, if I had a nightmare, I'd, I'd be running around the house, half naked, screaming and hollering, waking everybody up. Oh, I just seen a monster. <laughs> but look at you. Even this young brother here, he probably just said, oh, the <laughs> go right back to sleep. <laughs> Why does he know how to protect himself and me? I had to wake the whole house up. So you know that this is a protection for you. So don't remove yourself from protection to put yourself in harm. So inshallah ta'ala, you know, may Allah increase us all in that which is pleasing to him. May Allah increase us in beneficial knowledge of our religion. And may Allah keep us away from any knowledge that is not beneficial. May Allah make us of those who he is pleased with. May Allah make us from the people of Jannah, inshallah. Jazakumullah khayyam. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.